Hello, my lovely GIS students. Uh, after a couple of weeks of traveling, I'm back here. We're going to cover two practicums in one today. In fact, we're going to cover the entire subject of quantitative imagery analysis in GRASS GIS 7.4. Um, so, the first thing that you will need to do is to go onto the Blackboard site and to download the um, GRASS location that I told you about today in class for uh, Calabria, all right? It's this little zip file, UTM, WGS84, zone 33, north.zip. And then also along with it, you want to get this little file with all the funny numbers that says .met. And I'll explain exactly what that is when we get a little further along. So put this somewhere in a GRASS database. I'm here in, in my GRASS database called Class GRASS Data. And I have a few of my other GRASS locations in here. All I have to do is to right click and uh, it'll be different on your computer specifically, but uh, find how to extract it into the place. Um, and there it is. It becomes a grass location. If we go into it, it's just got a permanent folder and all the same stuff that grass has in, in any permanent map set inside any grass location. So let's get grass started. I'm going to start mine from my command line. Grass 7.4. You could just be double clicking your grass icon. At any point you need to get to here. Make sure you've navigated to the correct GRASS database and then you should see the new location show up right here and we've got a permanent map set. So as with all GRASS projects I've already put uh, something in permanent but what you want in permanent is the stuff that you don't mess with. So that is the base Landsat imagery that I've already put in there for you. So I'm going to make a new project which I'm going to call Project 4, right? Because that's where we're at in class, our last project. And I'm going to start grass in my map set Project 4. And remember before, we can change uh, our view of what map sets we see. Now, by default, you can always see in permanent, but you could uncheck it. It's always useful to double check that. And we're in grass. Let's go ahead and look and see what's in there. So I'll just add a regular raster map, uh, d.rast. And I'll see that I've got this stuff. It says band 01, 0, 0, 0, 2, 0, 0, 3, 0, 0, 4, 6, 1, 6, 2, 7, blah, 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 blah. And you might be wondering what all that stuff actually is. Well, if you click on one, you'll see it's a kind of a weird, kind of a black and white image. It doesn't look like what you are expecting to see from any kind of photograph. It looks washed out and not right. Well, that's because Landsat is a multispectral imaging sensor and it has eight bands of imagery. Um, and those bands are actually uh, sort of made clear in the Project 4 description file. So if you get into it and you scroll down into part two, you find these tables, say Landsat 7 spectral band. Now there are eight Landsat missions and they're just numbered in order. Uh, Landsat 7 we're using because it's um, well, it's not the latest one, but it's still one of the, the, the very commonly used high-resolution Landsat uh, image. Uh, Landsat 8, the mission number 8, is a little bit more complicated. So we're, we're, we're going to do this because it's a little bit easier to, to deal with for the time being. And yet you can still do a lot of stuff with it. Um, and here you have band 1 is blue, band 2 is green, band 3 is red, band 4 is near infrared, 5 is shortwave infrared, band 6 is thermal infrared, Band 7 is shortwave infrared, and band 8 is what they call panchromatic. It basically covers the uh, blue all the way into the near infrared. If you look at the wavelengths, you can see it actually starts at the very end of blue and goes to the very end of infrared. So it's not exactly the same thing as a normal RG, like black and white that covers the RGB spectrum. It goes a little bit more into the infrared. But you can think of this like a, like a normal black and white image. Um, and then you can see over here just um, a, a, f a few uh, details about reflectances in these different bands and what they might be useful. And we'll come back to that in a second. Um, what I'll show you quickly over here at the USGS website, they have this kind of information for all the different Landsat missions all the way up through Landsat 8, which you can see has many more bands, which is why we're sort of not dealing with it for the time being. One thing that I should note that you will have sort of two of band 6 in there. You'll have a band 6.1 and 6.2. 
And that is because this band, they capture at 60 meters resolution and then they interpolate a 30 meter resolution one that they pass off as well. So you get sort of two copies of finer resolution sort of interpolated and then the coarse resolution original. All of the Landsat band, other bands are at 30 except for the panchromatic which is at 15 meters. And that will be very interesting because we're going to call do something called pan sharpening to get everything down to 15. But just wait. We have a lot of subjects to cover. So this is the same information over here. I'm going to make it go away. Uh, this is in your, in your um, project for description PDF. So you'll be referring to that as well. And there are two tables. There are this one about the bands, and then there's this one about the band combinations that we will get to in just a little bit. Um, now, the washed outedness of the imagery. We're going to deal with this because if you remember in class, uh, the, the cameras, the image sensors up in Landsat, are recording the actual uh, values of light that got hit to them on a linear scale. In order to make them look nice, we have to convert that linear scale to a, a gamma corrected scale or a scale that's closer to what our eyes expect it to see. Uh, and you may be asking yourself, well, okay, but that's fine. But if I'm just looking at them each as black and white, I mean, do I really need to go through all of that trouble? Well, the answer is we can actually create color images by telling grass to display an RGB, red, green, blue uh, image, a composite image, where you tell it which band to put into which red, which green, which blue of the computer monitor right here. So before I show you how to stretch uh, or to, to, to change the, the, the digital number, recorded by the satellite to a more pleasing visual reflectance, I'll show you how to make a composite RGB. It's pretty simple. We just go, instead to our, of our regular ad raster, we go to this one, add various rasters, where we went before when we were adding hill shades and that kind of stuff. But instead of adding a shaded relief, we add RGB map layer. And you get a D.RGB, and now you see you have three slots for raster maps, red, green, and blue. Well, all we can have to do is to go to, for red, we go to band three. Remember, that's the red one. Again, all of these things are in, in here, right? In here, in your project four description. Uh, band two is green, and band three is blue. And we click OK. And you say, hey, that doesn't look anything at all like <laughs> The color image, I, I think it ought to. If we gave it the right bands and all the right colors, it should look like a normal image. And that's because of this need to convert from digital number to actual visual representation. So in order to do this, what we're going to do, actually, the first thing we're going to do is to rename our bands here because I gave them these fancy names with all these zeros and stuff. And it turns out the little routine to reclassify the images doesn't like the leading zero. So you get a little bonus tip about how to rename maps in GRASS first. Um, to do that, you go to File, and then you go down to where it says Manage Maps, and you go over here. Now you see a bunch of other stuff, including Rename and Delete. And this is something I haven't told you about how to do to delete maps, but I might show you at the end of today. Let's go to the one that says Rename, G.Rename. And by default, it's on the uh, raster tab. If it's not, just make sure it is. Uh, go here where it says raster map to be renamed. Select our first one. Oh, actually, we can't rename it because we're not in the permanent directory. So what we're going to do is instead of renaming, we're going to copy. And we're going to go back to the same thing. We're going to go to manage maps, and we're going to copy g.copy. And here, it works in a similar way. Raster map to be copied, this one. And then we have to put a comma, and then we have to type a name. And I'm just going to call it band underscore one with no zeros, okay? And we just hit run, and we do that. And then we can do the same thing for band two, comma, band two, like this, and we can hit run. And in fact, we don't have to do this whole pull down because the names are pretty regular. I can just put a three there, and a three here, and we can hit run. And we can do this with four. So you see this can be a little tedious, but just stick with me for a second here, and we'll get through it real quick. 
Okay, when it comes to 6, remember there's a 6, 1 and a 6, 2. I'm just going to copy the 6, 1 because, again, they're redundant. One is just, of course, resolution of the other. So we're just going to deal with one band 6, like so. And then here we have a band 7, 0. And we have band 7, run. And then our last one is band 8, our pan chromatic band, our nice 15 meter resolution band 8. Okay. Now, we renamed them all. That's all good. Now what we're going to do is get into this new tab over here. We've done raster and vector, but we've never gone to imagery, right? So what we're going to do is we're going to go into um, this new imagery tab over here. I'm going to go down to where it says um, Satellite Images Tools. I'm going to go to Landsat DN to Radiance Reflectance. That's what we're doing. That's the technical term for what we're doing. And all we have to do here is to find the uh, actual base name. So what that is is really just band, and then the number will follow after it. And then we have to give a prefix for all the newly transformed maps. So it's going to transform all eight of those maps into something else. And I will call it Ruffle for reflectance, okay? And there's a bunch of other stuff in here, but you don't really have to worry about uh, about most of it except for this tab that says metadata and if you're thinking metadata what could that be yeah you know what you guessed it it's that little dot met text file I told you with all the numbers attached to it so let me go to where my grass data is and there it is this guy right here where this is the actual name of the Landsat scene I downloaded and the metadata has some information about the sensor the grass needs to know for it to be able to convert the digital number into the reflectance values. And at that point, uh, what did I just do? Band one at. Hold on. Let me just double check that I made. Uh, look at this. See, band one here is, is I put an underscore and I needed to have no underscore. So now I really am going to show you how to rename manage maps g dot rename. I'm going to find that band 1, and then I'm going to put a comma, band 1 like that, and we renamed it. And now, if we look at it, over here, you see it's been renamed to band 1, all right? Pretty cool, huh? So now, now we'll find this prefix, and I can just hit run, and there we go, it's doing its thing. And what did I do? Band 61. See, look at this. I'm catching myself in all sorts of problems. So let me go back and continue to rename. What did I do? Band. There is no band 61. Oh, you know what? I guess it really wants, because it's Landsat, I should have just, I should have just done it. Right? I should have just copied all of them in. Band 61, I probably have to copy in. Band 62, otherwise it's going to, give me problems again. See, I'm trying to do shortcuts for you, and this is another life lesson. Don't do shortcuts. Do it all the right way. So let's copy in band 62. Get that in as well. Band 62. Okay. So it's looking for all the right numbers, and you know, I should have just did it the right way. Uh, I'm just going to make sure I hit my um, overwrite, so it overwrites everything. And there we go. Now it did it, and there's no complaints. Okay, so we're done with this, this uh, iLand set to AR. We can close that. And so this is what it looked like before, when we, before we changed to reflect its values. Let's add another RGB map layer. And this time, let's go to our Raffle 3, Raffle 2, and Raffle 1. And we'll click OK. Ah! Look at the difference, all right? Look at the difference between before and now. Now, instead of being weirdly pink and dark, the colors are actually in the right um, tone palette. But you might be thinking to yourself, eh, that is still really dark. And guess what? You're right, it is really dark. We have another tool to run to correct the brightness values of this so that it will show up in a more balanced way. So we go back to imagery. And then we go to, uh, where is it? 
uh, manage image colors and then color balance for rgbi.colors.enhance and now we pick our ruffle 3 for our red channel our ruffle 2 for the green and then our ruffle 1 for uh, the blue channel you can hit this and run it at default and then you have to redisplay and it looks brighter and it might be better right um, there are a couple other things we might want to do we might want to click this extend colors to full range of data on each channel this is on the colors tab so let's hit run and redisplay and that put us back kind of there so we don't really want to do that uh, we might want to preserve relative colors adjust brightness only and then we get a little bit of a brighter image and uh, by the way, we can also reset back to the way it looked. So you can go back like this. In this case, it sets it to black, right? Um, so let's try extension. Well, okay, I think probably in this particular case, um, just the default value was the best, right? Yeah, that's pretty good. It's a little bright along the edges, but really all of that white stuff really is white. It's, um, it's white gravels, alluvial gravels in this particular area. And now we can see these clouds out here at sea as well. So this is pretty cool. We can now zoom into our little color area. This is Amendolea Valley. This is San Pasquale where I do my field work. And in fact those drone images were taken somewhere in this, this part of, actually this part right here, and this part right here of the San Pasquale Valley. And so we can zoom in even more until we start to see the pixels, our 30 meter pixels of uh, San Pasquale uh, Landsat image. And when you get this far in, it's, it's starting to look really pixelated and we might, like, we might be pretty unhappy with that. Um, but remember, we do have some high resolution imagery. We have that band 8. So let me just add a regular RAST, DRAST, and I'll pick my raffle collected band 8 and I'll stick it up on top of my map. And look at that, all right? So now let's zoom out a little bit and zoom in, let's say, on the coast. And so now what we can see, if we go back and forth between these two things, see quite a bit more detail in that 15 meter resolution band 8 than there is in the 30 meter um, other bands. Now, we can do something really interesting, something called pan sharpening. And what that is, is, okay, let's zoom in actually on like this little area here. You see this kind of coarse white area and a white area here and then like kind of darker area right here. And if you sort of go back and forth, you can kind of see how those patterns in luminance are the same between the two uh, sets of imagery. It's just that the resolution is coarser. And of course, the specific band is, uh, you know, the reflectance of the specific bandwidth of, of light is slightly different. But the pattern, the general pattern of luminance and darkness is essentially the same across most of these. We can use that information to, to intelligently sharpen the coarser imagery, taking with it some of the patterning at the finer resolution of the, of the pan chromatic 15 meter. Now this is not the same as if we had taken the actual photo, the original photo of the R, G, and B bands at 15 meter resolution, but it's an intelligent estimation of what they most probably would have been had we done that. Okay, right? Think about that for a second. So this doesn't replace taking a finer resolution image, but it at least is using information that really does exist to guide the sort of interpolation of a finer resolution. Uh, to do this again, we have to remember we have to use the um, digital number, the, the, the number that came from the satellite, not the reflectance that we just translated to because those values are now mapped away from what the real reflectance is. And we want to start with the real reflectance value. And so to do that, all like everything, we have to go to our imagery group and we go to where it says pan sharpen, I dot pan sharpen. And we pick our red map, again, we're going to pick our original band 3, not our ruffle 3, our original band 2, not our ruffle 2, our original band 1, not our ruffle band. And then we pick our band 8 for our high resolution. And then we give a base name, pan sh, or pn sh, like that. 
And there are a couple of different methods that you can use for pan sharpening, but this um, Broby method is probably the best one. Um, like everything in Grise, you can read in the manual. Um, uh, you can read in the manual about the different ones, but Broby works probably the best. So let's just hit run on that. It's going to do its thing. Going to take just a little bit, and uh, what we can do now is add ourselves a new um, RGB. Oops, a new RGB thing, and we'll find our pen sharpen red, pen sharpen green, pen sharpen blue, and we'll hit OK. And you're going to be freaking out about the color, but remember these are still digital numbers. So guess what? Yeah, you guessed it. We have to go back into this deal, satellite image tools, Landsat DN to reflectance, and here we can put PN sh, and we can put PN sh ruffle. You see, I'm doing all my nice acronyms. We can grab our same metadata file, which should be in my uh, grass data, and run. And one. What did I do? Oh, you know what? I got to. I probably have to rename those things to B1, 2, and 3. So let's try that again. After renaming, pin sharp blue, pin sharp, uh, what is it? it? Should be 1, pin sharp 1. Run. And then let's do. Pan sharp green should be pan sharp two, and then pan sharp red should be pan sharp uh, three. And oh, whoops, that was the wrong one. This is the one I want to run. Okay. Okay, and then it may say, oh, I can't find a number four. That's okay, we only had three of them at this particular moment. So I'll go in here, and I will change to my pan sharp, sorry, this should be number three, pan sharp reflectance two, pan sharp reflectance one, we hit okay. And now we've got our colors getting close, and yet we have one last thing to do, is to go to color balance and then go down to our same ruffle, pan sharp ruffle three, pan sharp ruffle two, and pan sharp ruffle one, and hit run and redisplay. And there we go. All right, now we have a high resolution uh, Landsat satellite. Um, let's try this. No, that didn't look very good either. Let's try both of those at 15 meter resolution. Yeah, there we go. That's a, more, a little bit more natural. Maybe a little dark. Um, a more natural uh, color satellite at high resolution uh, uh, from our different uh, satellite bands. Whoa. Okay. You might want to pause and go deal with this for a little bit. Um, and when you come back, we're going to talk about color manipulations, NDVI, and then um, supervised or unsupervised classification. Okay? Okay, you're back. Look at that. Um, I'm going to clean up all of this stuff that I've got going on over here. Um, I'm going to leave one instance of eye colors enhance up. Um, and oh, sorry, this is this is when you're trying to multi do too many multitasking things. That can go away, and uh, G rename can go away as well. Okay, and I'm gonna actually just uh, I'm gonna remove everything from here, and we're gonna start kind of fresh. Okay, we're gonna start kind of fresh. Okay, so let's start with another one of our RGB guys over here, and now instead of just the, the regular visible light. We're going to go into our Project 4 description. We're going to go down to these 
Landsat 7 spectral band combinations. And then you'll see on the left, you'll see um, what it is that you could, uh, that you're trying to enhance or to try and see better or more clearly. And then you'll see the different bands, right? And up here, it tells you why those bands. It tells you that band four emphasizes biomass and shorelines, whereas band six discriminates moisture content of soils, vegetation, and penetrates clouds, right? So each band is good for reflecting certain, uh, 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 reflecting off of certain objects with certain chemical compositions that do that. They absorb and they reflect, right? And so the different combinations here are going to create what we call false color images. It's still going to be red, green, and blue, but the red, the green, and the blue that you see will actually be mapped to colors that you can't see into the infrared and beyond. Okay? So we already did a natural color, 3, 2, 1, red, green, and blue. Let's do a false color urban, band 7, 5, and 3. Band 7 is shortwave infrared, and it deals with rocks. Uh, band 5 is uh, uh, a different shortwave infrared, uh, a sort of smaller shortwave infrared. Again, that's uh, soil and vegetation. And then 3 is red, right, and vegetation as well. So let's do that. So we'll go, instead of red, we'll go to band 7, 3. And again, we'll pick our reflectances that we did earlier. And then we'll pick reflectance 5 instead of green. And instead of blue, we'll pick reflectance 3, okay? We'll hit apply, and we'll see this crazy color map over here. And really what this is, if we think about it, is uh, showing us vegetation in green, which is pretty normal, and then kind of rocks and dirt and stuff in blue, which is not normal, not what we're used to seeing. Let's look at a different um, combination. Let's do color infrared for vegetation 4, 3, and 2. This is a very common one more common than this one that I, I'm showing you right now. So for red, we'll pick 4, which is in fact a near-infrared map. Uh, and we'll pick 3 for um, green, which is in fact red. And then we'll pick 2 for blue, which is in fact green. And we'll hit apply. And we'll see this. And we'll see this nice red for vegetation and this sort of teal for other stuff. Now, we might want to run this eye colors enhance on uh, this as well. Um, so let's do that. Let's pick REFL uh, 4, REFL 3, and REFL 2 in exactly the same order we pick over here. 4, 3, 2, 4, 3, 2, and we hit run. And we redisplay. Oh, okay. Now the colors are starting to pop a little bit. Um, one thing that we could potentially do is to uh, reduce some of the cropping intensity. We can put 95% here, hit run. And so it might brighten it a little bit. I mean, that's a little too bright. In fact, probably what I want to do is to go the, the opposite way, up to 99, hit run. There we go. Now that's a really good looking um, image. So let's... Um, Let's add in our, our regular colored image. In fact, let's add our pan sharpened um, normal color image. So we just compare the two things. Apply. Okay. And then let me let me brighten this again with our with our eye colors enhanced. So I'll pick those three, two, one of our pan sharpened reflectances. Three, two, one, and I'll actually try this and see if that looks better. And I'll reload. Yeah, let's see if I can go all the way to 100 on that. Oh, 100 is too far. Wow. Okay, so we'll go back to 99. Whoops. 99 on that. Okay, we'll deal with this. All right. So here's our pan sharpened image, at, which is in regular color. And here is our false infrared, false color infrared. All right. In fact, you know what? Instead of this um, pan sharpened guy, let me. Um, where is my properties? 
oh, it's hiding. It's hiding somewhere behind me. There it is. Okay. Let me actually add my just unpan sharpen three two one. Just so that they're not there's no none of these artifacts that come from the pan sharpening. This sort of weird weird noise in the C over there. Let's hit apply. Okay. And in fact, what's going to happen is because we're using some of those colors. In, um, in this guy, they're going to be unbalanced over here. So we're going to have to go back and forth between that. So let me quickly do that real quick. Three, two, and one. Uh, like that. Hit run over here and reload. What do we do? I guess it's because I'm trying to use both of them in both images at the same time. So we'll forget about that. The point is that you can actually see the vegetation is showing up green over here. is actually showing up red over here. That's really what I wanted to show you. Um, so what you should do is to play around with some of these different ones, like 451. And again, running our eye, eye colors enhance every time. Um, and probably what I'll have to do is to reset the colors between each one before you try running it again so you can see your oh here's the problem I have three two three three two three see I knew I'm doing I'm not always doing this stuff too fast okay there we go that's a normal and that's the NDP that's all I wanted to show you okay uh, mystery solved right mystery solved so we can go back and forth between two of these different band combinations. So you can do your, your, your various combinations and see what you are, uh, what you get. Now, let's say you get a combination and you want to make it permanent and you don't want to have to load them in each time. You just want to see one image. Well, you can do that. You can do that from the raster, manage colors, and then create RGB or R dot composite. And here you can pick your um, three your two and your one for a regular color image and then you would put here uh, LSAT LSAT normal color right LSAT normal color you could mess around with some of the brightness but let's just leave it like that we'll hit run and now we have a single raster map or single layer that will have all the RGB fused and you can do this with any band combination that you want. So I can pick my four, my three, and my uh, two to do my near infrared. And I can do NIR color, right? False color. I can hit run. And now I have this guy over here. And now that's a permanent map and you can just display it as the background, for example, in a map project or something like that. You could export it to GeoTIFF whatever you want to do at this particular point. It's a single raster map. Okay, so you can see how we can go through different combinations of bands and we can highlight things like vegetation um, or, or rocks or urban areas or something like that. Let's talk about two different techniques for having the computer kind of automate a little bit of that. The first one is going to be called the, uh, a vegetation indice or an indice that is a, it is a mathematic product between multiple bands and the other one will be classification. Uh, both of them take place through the imagery uh, tab uh, but the first one that we'll do which is the vegetation indice we'll go down to where it says satellite images products and we'll find vegetation indices i.vi right? uh, we're going to do an ndvi because it's a very common one but I want to go quickly first to the manual and to show you all of these guys right here. Every single one of these is a commonly used indice. This difference, the, this is different from a false color image in that we're doing image math between the bands to produce a new product where the values in the product relate to a specific kind of thing. Now all of these products relate to the specific bands that we use and what they're good at, what they reflect off of, right? So it's the same idea as the 
false color. It's just doing it in a more mathematical way. And if you want to know what each one of these things are, there's a list of them down in here. And then down here it tells you exactly which bands are being used and what the formula is. So if we scroll down until we find the NDVI over here, we see we're just using the red channel and the near infrared channel. And what it is, is the near infrared minus the red over the near infrared plus the red. And that will give us an output map between minus one and one, in which one is healthy vegetation and minus one is mostly just water, okay? So, to do this, we go to the required tab all of these will require a red map, and they really want the real red map, not the reflectance, right, and not anything else. We just want the one that says band three, the digital number map, okay? And uh, name for output raster map, I'll just put NDVI in all caps. And to calculate this before you hit run, you have to go to the optional inputs, because depending on which indice that you want to calculate, you need to input a different number of other bands as well. In this particular case, the only other one we need is the near infrared in band four. Um, if you want to do some of these other ones in the manual, make that big again, go down and find the different channels. Like this one needs a blue channel right here. Um, this one needs a green channel and a blue channel, right? And then once you find what you need, that's when you put it in over here for the green channel, for the blue channel, and sometimes fifth and sometimes seventh, right? Um, some of them have some other um, factors that you have to put into, but we're not doing any of that. We're just doing NDVI. It's pretty simple. At this particular point, you just hit run. And you get a map that looks like this. Let us put on our legend for the NDVI. And then now we will see, let me move this up here. The values go from, in our particular case, 0.73 to point minus 0.49. But the theoretical min and max are minus 1 and plus one. So anything that's on this sort of browns through the greens is vegetation. Anything that's white is probably rocks. And anything that's blue is probably water. Now you can see it's not perfect. There are some definite, you know, hiccups here or there. But if we scroll in, for example, to the Amendolea Valley, we see that all of those white rocks show up as rocks. And all the vegetation in the hill slope shows up in greens. And if we do this back to our normal color. We can see how it maps on between them. And if we go to our false color infrared, we can actually see the brighter red, the lusher the green, right? That's the sensitivity between re the red channel and the infrared channel uh, bands right here. Now here, the darker the green, the healthier the vegetation. So we can actually see some very interesting patterns emerging and on the hill slopes. Um, so if we keep going back and forth, we could see that in our false color. Um, and we can even see some of that in our regular color uh, image as well. Now the neat thing about the NDVI is that here in our regular image, it's kind of hard to tell between, is this a shadow? Is this just a dark rock? Or is it vegetation? The NDVI is not fooled, all right? It actually classifies, uh, classifies them. And of course, what you can do is use all the stuff, the cutoffs and all that kind of stuff that we've done before in grass to just show 0 to 1, for example, I hit apply. And now um, we've got rid of all of the things that are not vegetation. right? And we can even potentially say, I'm only interested in healthy vegetation. So I'll do like 0.2 to 1, and I'll hit apply. Right? And then we only have really green, healthy vegetation. And we can put that over some of our other maps. Right now we can actually see the forested parts at upper elevations and the riparian growth and maybe the farm fields. Like over here in San Pasquale, all of these are farm fields. And we can see how lush they are because they're irrigating them for sure. They've got wells there, which is really, really, really cool and potentially very useful. Okay. That brings us through NDVI, and we have one last thing to do, which is to do an image classification, and we'll do it. We'll zoom back out. We'll zoom 
Actually, what we'll do is we'll just zoom to the whole map. Right there we go. Um, I could show you the NDVI at the whole. So we can see Aspromonte, the, the, the national park in the forest, is very, very, very forested and shows up with very healthy vegetation. Now, what if we wanted to uh, encapsulate that into a map? Well, you could do a map calc statement with the NDVI, but you're only at that point getting vegetation and then maybe water and then nothing else, right? It's really difficult to, to say that, well, you know, this is rock and this is water because we see that it's not perfect when, uh, when, when we go in at a detailed level. Um, so what we'd rather do is to have the computer do that uh, for us, okay? And that's called unsupervised classification. It's going to look across all the bands of light that you give it and try and find patterns. Now, in order to do this, we have to make something called an imagery group. And we go to the image tool and we go to the very first one, develop images and groups, and we go to create edit group. And what we'll do is we'll just go to the add tab before we do anything else. And then what we'll do is we want again the digital numbers. So we'll just start typing band in where it says pattern. And it will find and select everything with a prefix band. And forget all the ruffles and the pan sharpens and all the stuff we made. All right. And we click OK. And we'll see all that stuff over here. Now we want to give this a name. And we'll call it LSAT. And... Um, oh, I guess I should have done that first. All right, band, okay, and then we hit apply, and it was it says okay. We created it now. If we go to the pull down, we have a pan sharpen. This was made automatically by Grass uh, when we did pan sharpen. But LSAT has bands one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, six, one, six, two. Okay, let us create a subgroup in there. We have to have a group and a subgroup, and the reason is this is the group is all the bands of the Landsat, and the subgroup is just the bands we want to use for our image classification. So we'll do select all, but we'll go down and we'll uncheck 6.2 because it's the replicated 6 band at a coarser resolution. And we'll call this um, class, just for cl so we know that this is for classification. So we'll have an image group and then a subgroup that has pretty much all the same ones except band 6.2. We'll hit apply and it was selected. So we'll do that and we'll get rid of it. So we had to do this so that when we go to do the classification routine, we just tell Grass the name of our group and subgroup and then we don't have to input all the bands all the way down through all these different pull down menus. It saves us quite a lot of time. All right. So to do classification, unsupervised classification, we need to two tools. Okay, we go down to imagery, classify imagery, clustering input for unsupervised classification, i.cluster. We put that over here. And then we go back to imagery, um, classify image, and then we go to maximum likelihood classification, i.maxlike. Now, we need to use these in tandem because there is such a thing called supervised classification where I would digitize little polygons and say read the spectral signature from my polygon and then get a signature file and put it into the classifier. Here we're telling it to just look at the whole map and come up with some number of groups on its own, make the signature file and put it into the classifier. So the classification step is second for both of these and in fact it's the same step, the same routine to classify them. It's the generation of the signatures between all the 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8 bands of light that will be different how we generate that. In supervised classification we say this is forest, this is gravel, this is water, and look at these little tiny areas where we've done this and create the signatures from just those and then spread that to the rest of the map. In unsupervised clustering we say here's a map of all eight bands. I think there are five things and you find five things and then pass on what you think the five things are to the classifier so that we can look at what you found, what five things that you found. And that will make sense after we start doing it, okay? So we start with I cluster, and we get our name of our image group, LSAT, that we just made, and our subgroup class. And we have to make a name for a file for the signatures, so I'm just going to put SIG, right? 
we go to settings over here and we tell it the number of things that we want to find, in initial number of classes. I'm going to tell it to find five things here. And then we can fool around with a few of these things. I'll talk about them in just a second. Um, but the very uh, last thing that we have to do is to make an output file to contain the report, basically to, so that we can human read those signatures and know what's in each of those things. So I am going to go, I'm just going to write it into my grass database. I'm going to call it classification report.txt so my text reader can read it. And I'll click save, okay? And I will hit run. And nothing happens because it's not actually displaying any map. All it's doing is creating that signature file. Now, we have to go over to our maximum likelihood classifier. Tell it the name of our image group and our image subgroup. And then it will find now the fact that there is a signature files in Grass. Grass keeps track of where that is. And then right here, classific results, right? There's a new map. And that's basically it. You hit run. And then we get a map that comes out the other end. And it may say something like signature one is not valid. And that's because if we're zoomed out to the whole extent, we have this part that's off the map. And so it doesn't like that at all. What we can do now is to sort of get our query tool and see, OK, that purple is class two, yellow is class five, teal is class four, and this darkness thing is class uh, let's see, class four, three, okay? In fact, what we can do just to make our lives easier is to zoom in to, let's say, this part. If we don't care about the um, curve, let's zoom in even closer, something like, like so, right? So we have a little bit of ocean, and then we have land, and we will set our computational region from display, and we'll go to the optional tab over here, allow to overwrite, and hit run and then same deal over here optional tab allowed to overwrite and hit run all right and now we didn't get that little warning and our cluster has kind of changed a little bit which is kind of interesting uh, and now we can click around oops click around with our query tool and that's cluster five purple is still one and this is two right and we go okay that looks pretty cool Let's go back over here, and we should see that it made our classification report. So I'll open it up in my text editor, and you'll see all of these numbers over here. It'll tell you the bands, and it'll tell you the order that it read them in. And it may not read them in in the order that you think it did. Not 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. It instead reads them in 2, 1, 7, 4, 6, 1, 5, 8, and 3. All right? Now, this is important because when you go down here, it says initial means for each band. And this order for class one, the, this order right here, follows the same order. So band two, 41% of class one or whatever it is, or 41 reflectances, uh, uh, go to band two. 60.865 go to band one. 20.14 go to band seven, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. That's the signature, right? That's what it started out with sort of randomly picking five areas. And then it did this iterative thing where it went through them multiple times, and it tells you what it did over here, iteration one, two, three, four, until it converged on a final five classes. And it tells you, this is a separability matrix, how similar each class is to each other. And so you read this like three to one, 2.8, right? Five to one, 4.3. And basically, the closer to zero this number is, the more similar the bands are. So it's why one to one is zero. So essentially, um, class three and class two are pretty similar to each other. Class five and class four are pretty similar to the other. And the, and the rest are getting more and more separate from each other. And then finally, this is the final signature for each one, the mean and standard deviation of reflectances in each band. And again, you have to read the order here, two, one, seven, four. A little annoying that it does that, um, but you can easily put this into a spreadsheet and put it back into one, two, three, four, five, six, whatever. And then you'll be able to see that class one, um, actually, let's click around over here. Let's see, um, here's vegetation in green, right? So this teal colored one is class three. So class three 
has high values in um, whatever this one is. So one, two, three, four, five. Now let's go up here. One, two, three, four, and five, right? So really we have near infrared and then we have thermal over here. And band three, which is our visible light, is the last one. And so class three, 43, kind of interesting, right? So it's really reflecting a lot in the infrared and in the thermal, and it's absorbing quite a bit in the red, which is what we would expect for healthy vegetation, right? So you have to go through your little file over here, match it to the classes that it makes, and very helpfully you can go back to some of your um, other, uh, you know, false color images like this, or to your NDVI like this, when trying to interpret what it did. Now, one last little uh, thing that you can do over here is in the I cluster, you can, um, you can change a couple of different values over here to make the routine work a little bit better. And the one that has the biggest effect is cluster separation. And very often you have to do this in sort of increments. So I usually start incrementing to 0.5 and then I hit run. And remember I have overwrite uh, files uh, check and this is a very much a back and forth iterative kind of a thing and then we hit run and we redisplay and okay we didn't get much uh, increase um, so I'll go up to one I'll hit run and then I'll hit run and then ah we got a little bit better like we got more of the more of the forest is sort of ca uh, classified as forest now so that's pretty cool um, let's see if we can go up higher 1.5 hit run and then we hit run and at some point psh, it really breaks right so you've gone past the usefulness of that parameter and now it's giving false results so it's, it's I wouldn't say it's a magic parameter but it absolutely needs to be tuned to make the routine separate the clusters better the, the, you want the number that gets closest to blowing it up like this without blowing it up right that will create uh, clusters that are a little bit more meaningful uh, a little bit more segregated than um, than they might be if you, you you leave that number at a lower value. The other one is the convergence. This just tells it uh, a little bit uh, about how many times it needs to repeat its search until it until it's satisfied that it's not going to get any better. So if I make it go up to 99 and I hit run, you may not see any any uh, improvements over here. Um, but in fact, what we might see is that it repeated now up to eight iterations. So before it only did five iterations, now it kept going until it got to 99% um, stability, meaning the clusters weren't changing as it, as it added and moved things around between them. Okay? So that's basically what you need to do. Just keep, keep messing with some of these, these um, uh, mainly this percent convergence and the cluster separation until you get the nicest, most distinct set of clusters after you run it through max-like, and then go look at the spectral signature file, the report, and then using that information, your knowledge about the bands, and then your other overlays that you made, you can kind of interpret what each of the classes will be. So I'm going to say, in this case, class 4, the yellow class over here. I'll just have a legend for it. Right, class 4 is probably, um, let's resize this to a little bit of a smaller legend over here. Oops, too small. Resize, like so. Look at this, I need to be a bit more ambitious. Something like that, okay. So class four um, in yellow is almost assuredly rocks, right, and, and, and that kind of stuff. Class three, uh, is probably some sort of like dry vegetation. Class two is, um, let's see. Class two is our forest, and class one would be our water, all right? Oh, and the other thing that you can do is to change the number of classes. So we can increase them to eight, for example, and we hit run. And it may not find eight, and it's only gonna find six, right? And what we're doing is we're separating things out a little bit more. And we're actually getting some things that are probably not vegetation, but probably bare rock or something that are showing up. 
in some of these classes. Again, you would go back in here and you would look at now your spectral signatures for all of them. And now you'll see, by the way, it, it, it went up to 30 iterations. And it may be that it needs to go further than that. So um, you can actually increase that over here. You can increase the number of iterations to, let's just say, 100 like that before it will get to 99% convergence. And you'll do this, and you'll hit Run, and then you'll see over here, it actually did it actually did 43 iterations before it reached a stability level, right? So this is a little bit of a trial and error kind of a thing. And again, um, the, the routine in grass will run, but it may not be super meaningful. You have to read into the meaning. If you wanted to make it more meaningful, you would have to then, uh, you would have to then actually do a training routine, right? A training routine. Um, over here, what you can do is, uh, um, well, not too much different, right? You can have an output map to, 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 to hold rejected, rejected results if you wanted to. Um, but generally speaking, uh, you, you run a classifier um, or a signature generator, uh, so not a classifier, a cluster generator, a signature generator, and then you run a classifier on those signatures to then make your classes come out of your of your map. Um, well, just briefly to show you, if you wanted to do supervised, we're not going to do it, but if you wanted to do it, you would go back to your um, classify image and you would have to run this g.gui.i class and it brings up this tool and you have to load in some maps and you have to then draw your little boundaries using polygons over here to basically, um, well, basically to, to, to create little cluster, um, I guess little, little polygons to read, the training areas is what I'm trying to think, training areas to read out uh, a signature from, and then you will apply that to the rest of the map over here. And you can read some of its help file and that kind of stuff. Uh, it's a little bit more involved than what we need to do for <laughs> Project 4, so we'll just leave it at unsupervised classification. Um, and finally, I promised I would show you how to delete maps. Just a little tidbit. You go back to your management, delete, and this is definitely the danger zone, right? Check first the kind of map that you want to delete. I'll say raster map, and I will go down here, and what I will do is I'll delete one of my false color images. If I just hit run right now, it'll say nothing removed. You have to use the F flag. It's a double step safety so you don't accidentally delete something. You can hit run right here. Uh, and now we'll see over here that map is gone, right? No longer in there. One thing that you might want to do when you're dealing especially with images like this with the repeated base names, I'm going to uncheck force move for a moment, is go to the pattern. So click raster, go to the pattern, and then you can put a file search base name. So I could remove raffle, right? And I have to put a little amp, uh, star symbol, just the star symbol from the keyboard, and I hit run. And now it finds everything with raffle, and then the star is anything after that. Raffle is the prefix, and then star is whatever. It finds all of them, and I could definitely delete them had I checked this box right here. And that lets you, let's say, you did an operation and you made eight new maps all with this sort of new base name you want to get rid of them all in one fell swoop you can do that with the pattern search uh, over here on the second tab now this is definite danger territory which is why I haven't showed it to you until now um, do not confuse remove G remove which physically deletes the file with uh, right click remove this is not physically deleting the file from your computer this is just removing it from the map list over here, okay? To actually physically delete, you need to use G remove with the dash F, the force removal flag checked, okay? So now you're responsible. With great power comes great responsibility. All right, see you next time.